Hello, everybody, and welcome to our precisionary webinar today on May 23rd, 2022. It's a pleasure to have everyone, and it's our honor to have Dr. Astero Klempatsa, um, who is a team leader in cancer immunotherapy at the Institute of Cancer Research, located in London. Um, she is also a senior lecturer in King's College in London. She earned her PhD in research oncology, uh, which focused in meso mesothelioma apoptotic and hypoxia pathways from Queen Mary's College in the University of London. So she's been in the UK for quite a while and is still there. Um, and as a postdoctoral fellow, she gained expertise in CAR-T cell immunotherapy and immunobiology of thoracic cancers. Um, so she actually spent a, a bit of time over here on our side in the, uh, the United States at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and since 2019, Astera has been leading her own team, the Thoracic Oncology Immunotherapy Group, focusing on developing novel CAR T cell therapies for mesothelioma and lung cancer, um, as well as the immunobiology of these uh, cancers for identification of markers of response to immunotherapy. She is one of our best in the most knowledgeable users of the compressed dome <laughs> tissue slicer. So in this webinar, in, um, in her most recent publication, she's going to discuss how the compressed dome um, has helped her create precision cut tumor slices as an ex vivo model for her immunotherapy therapy research. And it's a pleasure to be able to make that possible. And it is our honor to have you here today. So I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Abby. It's a pleasure to give this webinar after all this time that you were trying to make me do it. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you everybody who is uh, attending. Um, I need to apologize before I start anything. There is a lot of construction going on just outside this wall. Um, so if you hear any sounds, it's because of that. I asked them to stop, but you know, they didn't pay any attention to me. So um, anyway, so um, I want to discuss with you uh, how I, I use or I'm trying to use the compressed dome in my research. Um, but before I do that, I need to give you a few slides of like background, um, a little bit on immunotherapy and cancer immunotherapy and my interest within this topic. So. Oops. So immunotherapy is any therapy that uses the immune system to treat disease. And uh, for the past like decade or so, it's been making a lot of waves uh, in a number of autoimmune diseases, but also in cancer. And there is several aspects, uh, you know, several different treatments to immunotherapy, uh, from antibodies to vaccination to engineered T cells to cytokine therapy. All, all of them are considered um, immunotherapy treatments. Especially in cancer, um, immunotherapies target one or more aspects of a very complex tumor microenvironment, especially in solid tumors you have like a microcosmos of um, immune cells that are, um, uh, that are cohabiting um, uh, together with the tumor cells, creating a very complex, but also a cold immune that you know form a cold immune response form a very a barrier that uh, you know that our immune response cannot really sort of like uh, pass and treat the tumor effectively so immunotherapies come in at various stages or various interactions or at var and target various cells of the immune system uh, that actually you know um that actually prevents a a, a, a proper immune response My tumor uh, interest has been, since my PhD years, uh, a cancer called malignant mesothelioma or asbestos cancer because it's caused by asbestos. This is a relatively rare cancer. Um, however, the UK currently and for the past few years has been having the highest incidence in the world um, of about 3,000 cases per year. Um, it's a cancer that is going to be around for a long time because uh, although um, the Western world has banned asbestos, 
in, um, in Asia, Southeast Asia, it's still in China, it's still used. Um, so we're going to see more and more of these cases, actually, because these are overpopulated uh, sort of like countries. Um, it's characterized as a disease. It's, it's developing in the mesothelial surfaces, uh, most often around the pleura of the lungs. And it's characterized by um, very poor prognosis, unfortunately, and uh, high resistance to treatment. So uh, there is an urgent need for better, more sophisticated therapies to be, to be developed in this cancer. And, um, and there, there are, or at least they're trying to be. So this is like from a review in 2018. So it's quite old, but this is like a list of all the immunotherapy trials that are going on in mesothelioma. And there is a vast number, including checkpoint inhibitors, vaccinations, um, engineered T cells, um, et cetera, et cetera. Anything is being tried in mesothelioma, but the common the common, uh, the common uh, theme uh, in all these trials is that it ha they haven't really been able to achieve a, a response rate um, uh, higher than 25-30%. So, so in immunotherapy for mesothelioma, but also for solid malignancies, it's currently the trend that you know, the, the response rates are very, very low. So therefore, what do we do? Do we throw these uh, immunotherapies in the bean or do we try to create some strategies and some assays, some markers that will um, actually uh, educate us as to who are these patients who respond and who are these patients who don't respond and then stratify patients this way. So I have been looking into doing this sort of thing in three different ways. Um, one is transcriptomics, uh, second, single cell analysis, and three, ex vivo studies. Um, oops. So in trans transcriptomics, what people, including in my lab, what we do is we create, we try to find some biomarkers of response using mostly uh, sequencing data by taking, uh, by taking, by sequencing tumors um, or uh, and, and looking at interferon gamma cytokine signatures that are quite important in cancer by looking at CD8 uh, T cell uh, signatures uh, or by also using in combination with immunohistochemistry, looking at pdl one expression, looking at the mutational load, these kind of things that can actually, you know, may be able to kind of like uh, categorize, uh, categorize these tumors as to kind of like more responsive or less responsive. And if you are interested in those sort of things, that is like, again, a, quite an old paper now, eight years ago, but um, but in this paper, it's, uh, they categorize tumors based on the density of the, of the presence of the CD8 T cells, but also the expression of PDL1. And they looked at sequencing data. And by, this, by these two marker combinations, they, um, uh, they, they categorize the tumors into four categories uh, where, you know, based on, these based on these two markers, the tumors were more or less uh, responsive to, to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. The single cell analysis is a little bit simpler in a way that it takes like, the real tumors from patients, uh, makes tumor digest and then uh, single cell suspensions and then analyzes cells during, uh, with flow cytometry. And um, while I was at Penn, we did, a, we did a study like this, which is now published, and we wanted to phenotype the immune landscape of mesothelioma, but we also wanted to focus on the T cells being the most cytotoxic immune cells and the cells that I take uh, have the primary role in an anti-tumor immune response. We wanted to see not only they are present in mesotheliomas, but also whether they're functioning uh, properly. So just a couple of slides to show you what I found because it's relative to my, my uh, use of the compressed um, uh, after that. So first of all, we found that the immune, the immune uh, there is an immune uh, landscape in mesothelioma. It's not really what we call cold tumor that really is, you know, a desert tumor. Uh, it does have a plethora of cells myeloid cells, B cells, NK cells, and it does have lymphocytes. Of course, uh, there is a huge range um, of lymphocytes um, from patient to patient. There is heterogeneity there, uh, but there are lymphocytes there. And we, if we look at the CD8 T cells, which are, as I said, 
the primary cytotox cytotoxic lymphocytes um, uh, that will take uh, that will be the, the at the forefront of the anti-tumor immune response. Um, we see that these express um, inhibitory receptors, which are the target of a lot of checkpoint inhibitor therapy, like PD1, for example. I'm sorry. But also the most interesting and novelty, you know, novel finding of this paper was that when we took this tumor digest and we stimulated it um, with anti-CD3 overnight, and then we looked at the intercellulars, at the secretion of interferon gamma coming from CD8 cells. Now interferon gamma, uh, especially, but also TNF alpha are readouts of T cell function when they function as a byproduct, they secrete cytokines, okay? So um, we looked at, uh, at the interferon gamma production of the CD8s from mesothelioma tumors, and we compared it from, uh, from the one from lung cancer, uh, um, lung cancer uh, tumors, or from tissues that do not have cancer, tumor-free lungs. And we saw that kind of like mesothelioma um, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, the CD8 uh, lymphocytes, were actually quite hypofunctional compared to the other cohorts. So, and one thing is that if we want immunotherapies to work, we really need to have functional, functional T cells. Um, so we thought that this uh, functionality, hypofunctionality of, of the T cells could be potentially a measure um, or a stratification, let's say, marker of whether a patient would respond or not respond to the to cancer to immunotherapy. Um, the third, uh, the third way to kind of like uh, look uh, look for uh, tumor responses and measure tumor responses is by using models uh, that uh, kind of like have the complexity of real tumors. Um, and of course, there aren't really that many. And I know, I mean, I don't know uh, all of your sort of like expertise, uh, but you would agree with me that especially in cancer, we, the models that we have, which is like mostly 2D cultures, are completely irrelevant to, to what's happening to a real tumor, right? And of course, we have the tumor xenografts, uh, but the tumor xenografts do not really um, have the... Um, the immune system of the patient whose tumor we are xenografting. And also we have, and I have explored 3D co-cultures and 3D spheroids and all of these, but even two, three cell spheroids do not recapitulate the real tumor. So by thinking of how we can actually do tumor response studies in a model that can be reproducible and um, uh, and also sort of like sufficiently represent the tumor complexity, we came I came across uh, tumor slices. So tumor slices have been used extensively for many years uh, in pathology on fixed tissue and frozen tissue. Uh, so the idea here would be like, can we can slices from fresh tissue, not from frozen or from formerly tissue, be cut by by vibratomes and used for ex vivo assays. Um, now, for the ones of you that do not, well, before I tell you this, so when I was at Penn, um, I happened to be in a lab uh, next to another lab, which had a very fancy instrument um, covered, uh, covered with its, in its case that nobody was using. Um, that was the Leica vibratome. So that was a, a live tissue slicer or a tissue slicer a vibratome. And in order for me to check, you know, I had the freedom to kind of like use it, nobody was using it. So I took some mouse, uh, some mouse tumors and I tried to optimize that machine. Uh, but for technical reasons coming from the instrument, uh, and we can discuss this in the Q&A if you are interested, I, I couldn't really optimize the instrument. Um, but I thought that this idea of I having an instrument that can cut live, live tissues um, could be really helpful. So um, then my boss said, oh, there is this company that I read about, Precisionary Instruments, uh, and they have a, you know, a very small machine. We can demo it. So 
um, I've been here team kindly sent us the sent us the, the compressed home for a demo and we ended up buying it after all. So the 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 precisionary instrument is quite easy to kind of like as a you know to you you know as a uh, to use but it's quite fiddly so you have to kind of like you know prepare your specimen glue it on a on a plastic cylinder which has a, this uh, plunger um, then fill the plunger with agarose that you then cool it with a cooling uh, with a cooling block and then you end up for uh, having a, a agarose salami uh, in the middle of which is your tissue you put it into the machine you um, you set the machine to the thickness that you want your slices and you start cutting away. That's the ideal, easy uh, way to do it, although things in the, it's, things in the process can go wrong. So the, the idea that I had was to take either tumor, either tumors from animals or even better from patients, slice it with a compressed stone, uh, keep, uh, keep, keep, the, keep the slices in culture and then use them for various assays that have to do either with um, metabolism or doing like uh, fluorescent uh, uh, immunofluorescence or use the supernatant to look for things. Um, I was mostly interested in, you know, in checking tumor responses. Before we started doing any experiments, however, um, real assays, I wanted to look first uh, to characterize the slices. Uh, does the slices pre preserve the tissue morphology? So we cut uh, slices, and these are like from a mesothelioma tumor. We cut it slices, and every 24 hours, we looked, so we created an H&E, and we looked under the microscope to see A, how the, micro, uh, how the compressed op has cut the, the tissue and B, uh, whether this, uh, the preservation of the tissue is, is good over a period of a few days. And we did that with the pathologies. So you can see that, you know, the tissue, at least for the first like uh, three, four days, it's absolutely perfect. You can also do um, immunohistochemistry on these slices. I mean, once you cut the slice and you have them in culture, you can then treat them as a, as a fresh uh, tissue that you can then um, fix and do immunohistochemistry on. And within this specific mesothelioma tumor, we could uh, detect uh, CDAT cells, we could detect macrophages, we did uh, caspase 3 to see apoptotic cells, and CHI-67 to see uh, proliferation. I also did a viability test where I um, treated the, uh, you know, I cut some slices, and that's like serial slices from the same tumor. And uh, every few days I um, stain them with DAPI and PI. So PI stains dead cells and DAPI stains nuclei. And I looked uh, by confocal microscopy to determine the viability of the slices. And as you can see, day 10, actually the slice is, I would say unusable. It's not all dead, but it's unusable. Uh, but up to day seven, I would use this specific, uh, this specific slice. So uh, we've done a few of them, and I should have put the graph in actually. Um, that and they all showed that the time frame of viability is between five and seven days. But five days is quite a long time, depending on the experiment you want to do, to actually you know lot tests. For example, a cytotoxicity of an agent or immune response. Immune responses normally you can check them after twenty four or forty eight hours. So another thing that we did is we want to, to see if we can have like a cytotoxicity assay that we can use. So I tried, um, I tried the LDH release assay. So lactate dehydrogenase is an, is a, um, um, it's a cytokine, I think, uh, that is released by dead cells in the supernatant. So um, at first I wanted to check what, what is kind of like the, the basal level of cell death that one sees in uh, in tumors. So I had the two, three slices that were untreated, left overnight, and uh, two, three slices that were treated just with water. Um, so that essentially killing the slice. And next day I took the supernatant and we did this ELISA. And so we, we determined that an untreated, a non-treated, let's say tumor slice 
more or less has less than 10 uh, picograms per mil uh, lactate dehydrogenase compared to a dead slice, which is like, you know, uh, much uh, larger than that. So um, how can we use the slices to study the human and the tumor immune response? Um, and basically the question is, can we detect T cell responses? Okay, at least uh, that's what I was interested uh, for. So to answer this, we I did three things. I, they, I, um, I, um, sorry, I just opened the chat just for a second. Uh, oops. Oh, I used direct T cell activators and I will explain to you what these are. I used by specific antibodies and I used antibodies that ch block checkpoint inhibitors on, sli on, on mesothelioma slices uh, just to see what uh, happens. So direct um, T cell activators, uh, um, CD3, CD28 is a direct activator, uh, but not a maximal activator of uh, T cells. For maximal activation, we use PMA ionomycin. That, you know, it's maximally um, stimulates T cells. So um, we are using this quite a lot in tissue JJS and whatever, so we know the dosages and everything. But uh, essentially what we did is we uh, created slices that we left either untreated or maximally activated them with PMA anomycin that are positive control, or we um, use CD3 or 28. And then after 24 hours, we use the soups to do um, uh, ELISAs of interferon gamma and TNF alpha, which, as I said, they're readouts of T cell, T cell activation. And as you can see, you know, both, um, uh, both TNF alpha and interferon gamma can be detected with CD328 and PMA ionomycin can, can activa activate the T cells with what looks like a quite a, you know, maximal sort of like activation. So, so yes, the slices that we can create uh, do have immune cells inside that are alive and that can function when stimulated and they can respond to stimuli. Um, in, these, in these sorts of experiments, we also did uh, thickness, uh, different thicknesses of the slices, because, you know, depending on what you want to do, you want different thicknesses. I wanted the thickness that was, um, that, uh, that actually could contain, um, you know, uh, immune cells enough to actually see responses, so I couldn't really use 10 micrometer slices. Uh, but I didn't want them to be so thick as to not um, allow diffusion of agents, uh, which is also a worry. So uh, we did various experiments, but this is just to show you the in relation to um, in relation to um, maximal stimulation, uh, we found that 500 micrometers thick were giving us what we thought a very very good uh, maximal stimulation. Obviously, it's dependent on the thickness because you have more T cells within this uh, within thicker slices. Uh, but you can see in the 250 micrometers, you hardly see any cells. Therefore, you don't see any stimulation. So, for subsequent experiments, I kind of like got used to use 500 micrometer thick uh, slices. And we also did a um, cytotoxicity, um, oops, cytotoxicity um, assay with, uh, as I told you, LDH ELISA when we did the activate simulations because we wanted to determine that uh, neither the PMA anomycin or the CD328 zeta did not really cause any sort of like major, um, major sort of like cytotoxicity. Uh, and this helps us because we can actually, you know, if you add an agent, like an antibody and that you think is going to be cytotoxic, then that's a good assay to measure cytotoxicity. Okay, the second thing that uh, we tried was to see if there was any cytotoxicity and activation by using by specific antibodies. So by specific antibodies are antibodies that have two arms. One arm is binding to an antigen on the tumor cell. In this, in our case, I used um, uh, anti-mesophilin. Um, so targeting mesophilin on my mesothelioma cells. And the other arm is an anti-CD3 which binds to the T cell, essentially bringing the T cell close to the antigen. 
Um, so again, 500 micrometer thick uh, slices were used and we used the, the bite, these bites uh, in a couple of doses. And the LDH assay showed some sort of like uh, some sort of cytotoxicity, not a lot, but bigger than the uh, untreated slice, the, the basal level of LDH release. And when we did uh, interferon gamma and TNF alpha on the supernatant, ELISAs on the supernatants, we showed that uh, there was a release of interferon gamma that it was uh, dose uh, responsive and TNF alpha, which was dose responsive. So yes, you can measure response by actually adding by specific antibodies to the bites. And then we started doing um, some um, uh, some work uh, on checkpoint inhibitor antibodies, uh, which didn't last long because it was my end of my or of my time at, at Penn. But now I'm picking this up again, where we actually use an array of checkpoint inhibitors together with an untreated slice and you know uh, and a control slice for the LDH release and doing antibody measurements. In this one that we have done. You know, depending on the patient, depending on the tumor, you might or you might not see response. So, for example, here you just see a little bit of response, a little bit of cytotoxicity with this anti TGID, the checkpoint inhibitor um, anti antibody, and a little bit with the anti 41 BB. Um, but we couldn't uh, detect any interferon gamma and we couldn't detect hardly any TNF alpha. You can see it's two picograms per ml, it's nothing. So I would say, for example, that this patient was uh, non responding to these checkpoint um, inhibitors. So the idea, the, the, the bigger idea of this is if you have a patient and you can actually take his tumor and uh, screen his tumor in this way. And you can get, you can be kind of like, you know, um, you can get a, um, a result as to whether his tumor responds or not here, then you, you don't put this patient on anti-TGID or anti, you know, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. You look for alternative therapies to that. Okay, so... Um, Yes, another thing is this, like another example, this is a lung cancer, actually, it's not mesothelioma. So uh, we did an experiment again with slices where we have non-treated, we have the positive control of maximal stimulation with PMA anomycin, we have CD3 stimulation, PD-1, combination of PD-1 and CD3. We have by specific antibodies that uh, actually target uh, EGFR, uh, which is an antigen on lung cancer cells and CD3. And then we have an anti pdl one antibody. And you can see this is just to show you what we, what we call a non-responder and a responder. In the non-responder, only um, the PMA anomycin, which is like the maximal simulator worked and everything else is not responding really uh, to any of these treatments. But in, in this case, the combination of CD3 and PD-1 antibodies and the bispecific HFR antibodies actually had a quite a good response you know, stimulated the T cells. So you would say that if there was a specific anti, uh, antibody therapy uh, that the, this patient could go, uh, could go to, then maybe, you know, this is the best uh, option based on the ones that we are testing. Okay, and then uh, while we're doing this kind of, uh, these kind of therapies, we find there's a paper um, that showed that lung slices could be frozen and then thawed and then used again. And, <laughs> You can understand that it was kind of like a little bit shocking because it kind of like opens the opportunities of these sort of like assays to a whole new level. You know, you take the patient, the, the patient's tumor, a diagnosis, you make some slices, you freeze it. If and when you need it, you can throw the slices to the assay just before you give him treatment or something, right? So um, what we did is um, we cut some slices and we froze them and then we thawed them. And every 24 hours for three days, you know, we did uh, LDH assay and uh, we looked at a couple of other things. So the LDA release appeared to be quite stable based on, you know, these three days. And uh, it didn't really uh, go beyond the basal, uh, the basal uh, level of um, cell death. We also did H&Es of these slices, and we saw that uh, for this three-day period, 
the slices retain their morphology, um, uh, you know, on the H and E. And we, um, we repeated this PI DAPI staining on the confocal microscopy. And you can, you can, you can actually, uh, you can actually appreciate that post day four, most of the slice, uh, most of the slice is dead. But up until day four, it's quite, it's quite uh, usable. Um, we did, we took this slice, a 96 hour post four slice, and we stimulated it with PMA anomycin, and it could get stimulated. So that told us that uh, you know there is a smaller time frame. But potentially, um, the slices can be frozen and can be reused. Uh, of course, I will show you some. Um, uh, I will show you some data. Uh, well, actually, now um, that it's not exactly the same because well, some immune populations they do not survive post thawing. There is some some death of the immune cell repertoire. So you kind of like have to extract that from what we have hap what would have happened if the slice was tested um, fresh. So I don't know how accurate your measurement would be if in a in a post fall situation. But just to show you a comparison between uh, fresh and um, frozen uh, slices from the same patient. So the tumor was given a lung cancer sample. We produced 24 slices, some of which were used, some of which were frozen down. Um, but um, but as part of the of the fresh, we activated them with the direct activators CD328 and PMA anamycin, and the fresh gave us this. This is the CD328. This is the PMA anamycin. And then the ones that were frozen, they were thawed again, and the same thing we did. So the trend is the same, but as you can see there is less, less, um, less amount of, uh, of uh, cytokine. And I think that's because it's less immune compartment, less T cells, because some of them did not survive the, uh, the freezing and thaw process. And um, we did, uh, we treated, uh, we treated with anti-PD-1 and anti or the combo of the two, some slices, fresh and post -thaw. And you can see that the post were kind of like uh, less in amount, apart from the combo, which I don't know what that means. But overall, the trend is that the frozen slices actually have the same trends with the fresh sli uh, slices, but much less concentrations because the, the content uh, of the slice is less. Well, the other thing that I do, as Abby uh, when, uh, told you when she introduced me, is that um, I develop CAR T-cell therapies for thoracic malignancies primarily, but depending on the tumor can be used in other solid tumors. So I wanted to see if exogenous T-cells can be added to tissue slices to assess the tumor microenvironment. So um, one of the CAR T-cell therapies that I do are, ta are targeting fibroblasts. Um, and F19 is a chimeric antigen receptor that I have in the lab that does exactly this. So I added, um, mesothelioma is a very fibrotic tumor. So it has lots of fibroblasts. So I sliced uh, a, a human uh, mesothelioma and I added um, uh, F19 CAR T cells at a different uh, effector, uh, at a different um, numbers, 20 million, 10 million, 5 million, et cetera. And after 24 or 72 hours, I measured the interferon gamma in the uh, supernatant. And I saw a kind of like dose response uh, uh, cytokine uh, production um, uh, there. So you can measure function of the CAR T cells um, after uh, adding them to these, uh, to these slices. And we started doing uh, some work. Uh, this is not the best figure, but it's only early stages where we want to kind of like figure out sophisticated ways where we can um, microscope or use the, the, the confocal microscopy to visualize interaction of the CAR T cells with the slice. Where do they go? Do they home somewhere specific? Uh, so the, the CD90 is a marker of fibroblasts. You can see how, fibro how fibrotic this tumor is, right? 
oops, and CD8 is a, a red is a CD8 T cells, and um, and DAPI is yes, DAPI is the the nuclei. Um, so we want to. It's still not, and it's still not fantastic. We are getting there, and we're still in the optimizing stages, but. Um, uh, we are trying to figure out where do they home to and how do they interact with the tumor. So that's another way that we, we will be using the compressed dome. So very recently, like a month or so ago, uh, a month or two ago, um, we wrote a little review um, as part of a special issue uh, for CAR T cells. Um, so we're invited, it's in antibodies, and we wrote a little review about precision cut tumor slices. Um, it doesn't have a lot of data, but it has like a nice sort of like literature review of how people use the slices in immunotherapy, uh, in chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera, in cancer. Um, I would say that, and this is like a table from, the, from, from our review um, that has the advantages and the limitations. I have to say that, um, uh, we, we put in the limitations car cannot currently be frozen or biobank because we didn't want we don't want to say otherwise because uh, although we could uh, kind of like keep them fresh post thaw um, we are currently uh, not sure whether what we are measuring is accurately depicting you know the actual patient response as we would be uh, with a fresh slice. Uh, another, another couple of limitations is that there is a lot of inter and intratumor heterogeneity observed. So, for example, in a little piece of tumor that we slice, let's say in 20 pieces, maybe piece one has a certain number of T cells that, does, that are non existent in piece number five, et cetera, et cetera. So, we one needs to use devices and to be kind of like taken, taken out of out a little bit of the experiment and look at what is the most um, fair way to take this assay in order to assess your tumor responses. For example, we're using a lot of control slices in order to kind of like do a test. And of course, uh, the other thing that we're currently investigating is that based on, based on the tissue that you have or on the tumor that you have, um, there are some post-transcriptional changes, uh, transcriptional changes observed. And um, I mean, don't forget that this is like a tumor that, or a tissue that is taken out of a body. So it kind of like it's experiencing injury and then it's been sliced again. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of like, uh, it signals a lot of kind of like uh, wound healing injury, all of these kind of like things. And um, so we need to assess whether these changes are actually very different from the original tumor. Saying all this, however, I think you can appreciate, but uh, what I have shown, the small piece of pieces of data that I showed you, that uh, these slices, at least by the compressed tome, um, actually are very good in retaining the morphology of the, of the tumor. At least this is my experience. Um, they are, quite inexpensive to generate and culture. I mean, all the instruments and all the accessories that, uh, that uh, are used are not super expensive. Even the machine is not super expensive. Um, you can do studies on the immunobiology, uh, that's for sure. And the more data we gather, the more we kind of like, um, we, we get more confident that uh, this can be a tool that can be used at least as complementary to other things that will educate uh, and, and inform us uh, towards stratification of a patient to, to more, uh, you know, to, to, to therapies that he would be more, um, uh, that he would respond better to. And with that, uh, I would like to stop and, uh, you know, thank my team and the thoracic surgery team here, the guys in London that give us a lot of tissue, uh, a lot of tissue to do this kind of uh, this kind of studies, but also my um, my boss and lab bucket pen, who actually you know gave me the space to explore uh, little techniques like this. Um, and um, yes, and I'm, I'll be happy to um, to answer your questions. I think there are a few in the chat already.
Yes, um, we actually, thank you so much, Estero. We have a lot of interest in some good questions. So I'm gonna start from the beginning and read off each of the questions and um, uh, maybe you can share us um, with us your wisdom. Um, so one of our um, attendees has asked, um, do you embed the tumor tissue in agarose before slicing it and how? Yes. So the um, precisionary instrument, uh, you know, the instrument comes with two uh, cylindrical plungers. I don't know if, you know, if this is the definition that you have to give to these cylinders, but it's basically a white plastic cylinder that has an outside steel cylindrical cover that, you know, that it's removable. So yeah. You, you, you take your tissue and you kind of like trim it the way you want it, you know, um, to fit on the, on the surface of the cylinder. And then using uh, glue, you literally glue your tissue onto this plastic cylinder. Once you have glued this, um, oh, actually, let me go back to the, um, once you have glued uh, your tissue, yes, so, yes, so, on, on, the, on the white area, once you have glued your tissue, then you use the steel, the steel cover of this plunger um, to kind of like, to push it like a, you know, like you would do with a syringe. And in there, you, you, uh, you pour the hot agarose that you then cool using a cooling block. Um, so once you are done, then you come up, you know, you have what you see in the second, in the second picture. Uh, which is kind of like a cooling cylinder of, of agarose within which is your, you know, steady because it's glued piece of tissue. Um, so the machine then will cut this as a butcher will cut, uh, you know, your turkey slices. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, Daryl. Um, so just to clarify on that question, they were asking, um, do you need to infiltrate the tissue with any agarose or you just embed it around it? Ah, okay, the tissue itself. So again, it depends on the tissue that you have. I had to, um, when I was given a tumor-free lungs that I used as a control, for example, so lung tissue uh, that is not firm, it's like very spongy, then yes, I actually um, injected it with agarose. I let it cool, and then I used that on the on the plunger. But for tumor tissues, um, especially for very fibrotic ones that are very hard, you don't need to do that. They're as hard as a brick. Got it. I'll move on. To, we have a couple of questions. So um, the next one is: um, Do you? Uh, it's about culturing. Um, do you culture on inserts? And do you incubate under normal uh, or under normoxic conditions? Yes, I incubate uh, in normal 5% uh, CO2 uh, incubator. So yes. Uh, now, did you consider on inserts? So we are currently um, testing this. Um, I didn't used to. In these experiments that you saw, I didn't used to. Um, but now a postdoc of mine is starting using them into insert, uh, in inserts and she's seeing that the, um, that the viability is actually, you know, better by using inserts. Uh, we haven't determined that yet, but this is the trend. So I would suggest if you have the money to use on inserts and stuff, start with inserts straight, straight away. Great. Great. Um, and um, another question is, um, at which point do you start collecting samples for evaluation in your experimental description? Um, because, um, and then the uh, follow-up question is, in other slice systems, there's a report of a cytokine storm for the first few days in culture. Did you see anything like that? Uh, yes, so I, I went, uh, I used my logic on this, to be honest with you, because I didn't really, okay, you know, there are some things in literature about the slices, but none that I could find, uh, you know, like a very big study um, uh, looking at uh, immune T cell responses. So uh, what I thought of doing is like cutting the slices and then leaving them overnight to rest. This is what we do, for example, when we thaw cells like T cells and stuff, because any process that you do, the immune cells kind of like, you know, get stressed. 
So you need to give them a period of distressing. So my exp my ex in my experience, um, I used to cut the slices, leave them overnight, and from the next day onwards, do my experiments. And no, I didn't see any cytokine storm. That's great. I'm glad you got um, healthy slices that way. A follow-up question about cultures is what kind of medium did you culture the slices in? I used DMEM, uh, <laughs> like enhanced DMEM. Um, other people, because uh, the other thing is uh, following my uh, purchase of the compressed home at Penn, another four labs at Penn got the compressed home, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. you know, like collaborative la uh, labs that doing were doing like heart T cells and stuff. And they also thought it was a great idea and whatever. And, you know, these people there had a lot of money. So you know, it's, it's lab, like out of five labs ended up having a compressed tom. So they all used it in different, in different kind of like ways and stuff. But I know mm -hmm. people that used it with like the absolute minimum, um, minimum sort of like growth uh, media. I know of people that actually added growth factors into their media. Um, but I did, I did enhance the mem because that's what I use in like when I have like tumors and tumor digests I use that and it works pretty fine so uh, I thought okay I want something that it's it's in my daily use I don't want to get it completely out of my way to make this work you know got it um for the next one I'm gonna um, ask one of our attendees Vidya um I think to I'm gonna have you unmute to ask a question directly mm -hmm. hey Dr. Kalam Kalam Star. Thank you for your presentation. It was extremely uh, informative. Um, one of the questions I have is like, um, when you embed these slice tissues in agarose, do you keep them in agarose for all your assays? Does it interfere with your assay in any way? Well, one thing I have to say is that rarely the agarose stays around the tissue. At most okay. uh, times, the moment you slice and it goes into the, um, it goes into this uh, buffer tray here, you will see already a split between the agarose and your tissue. So if you don't want to have agarose in your wells when you collect your slices, you can very easily with your forceps just separate it from your tissue, you okay. know, before or after you put it into the wells. It's not a problem at all. Okay. And then when you did the viability assays, did you still use the 500 micron thickness that you use for your LDH and your cytokine assays, or was it in different thickness when you tested the viability? And also when you're cutting these sections, do you see, because when you're cutting 500 micron versus 5 micron or 10 micron, the mm, tissue accessibility to the nutrients might change. So are you seeing like more viability on the outside where they are more exposed to the nutrients versus in the inside of the tissue where they might have difficulty? Yeah, I um, we did uh, we did uh, kind of like you know optimization assays like that to you know based on thickness, and I think the cutoff point for us was about the one uh, the one thousand micrometers after which the diffusion of drugs and nutrients was not as good like in okay. the two, the 2000, for example, okay. um, in the very, very thin slices, on the other hand, uh, you kind of, you might miss, um, you know, the responses that you get and the measurements that you get, whether it's cytotoxicity or immune responses or cytokine, cytokine measurements and stuff, they're not very, very big. And that you know, and that holds them, the fear that uh, you or viewers or people might not sort of like believe that this is a real, a real response that you are seeing. So you need to have like, you need to find, depending on what you want to see, you need to kind of like optimize at various thicknesses and see at which thickness you can find the balance between what you need to, in order to get uh, the measurements, you know, like, um, um, not accurate, but um, measurements that can be, um, that can be interpreted as real measurements um, versus to having a slice that operates as a whole and not as you say, you know, um, only only the you know only the perimeter of the slice and whatever. Okay. For your IHC analysis, do you take these tissue slices after treatment and embed them in uh, FFP for cutting sections for IHC analysis? Yeah, you can do that, yes. 
Okay, and, and for your freezing, do you use the your DMA media with 5% DMSO for freezing or use any special no. media for? No, I use the media with 5% uh, DMSO. Okay, um, I think, um, and how long were they frozen before you thought them back to do your assays? At le well, uh, normally I, well, I put them first in, um, um, I put them first for at least like two days in minus 80. And then I put them in the, in the liquid nitrogen for about a week uh, minimum. So, you know, just you put them there and you forget them uh, basically for a bit. Yeah, I want to move on to a couple of other questions from other yep. attendees. Um, one had asked, um, based on your bite experiments, have you checked whether T cells are actively moving in your slices? Or do you think that the bite antibodies only target T cells that are by chance in close proximity to tumor cells? Yeah, well, this is a part of why I really want to optimize uh, sophisticated confocal microscopy. Uh, because I can then sort of like tag T cells, even endogenous T cells with something. And then you can kind of like see, you know, what stimuli you get and from what, uh, from what cells. Um, I doubt that, um, well, it can, but um, generally speaking, you know, it's the thickness of the slice is quite small. Um, I doubt that you see cells only in the periphery, but you might do. It's, it's also depending on, you know, the slice that you have, the tumor that you have, the specific site of the tumor that you have sliced. So it might be, but um, we have done experiments where we actually determined that bites can actually, you know, can, can diffuse within the slice. So where they find the T cells and they, you know, and the antigen, we don't really know where that happens, but it would be nice to know. Um, somebody asked experimentally, what inserts do you normally use for these studies? And could you possibly share a link or the specific What name? inserts? Yes. The millicell ones. If you put millicell inserts. Um, millicell? Yeah, millicell. Okay. And um, just a few more questions, then we'll wrap sure. up. Um, sure, no problem. How many replicates do you use per treatment group? So for example, <laughs> how many slices each for PD-1, etc.? Yes, so I will, uh, I will give you a trick now. I will tell you my trick. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, we use at least replicates. Of course, that depends on how much tissue you have, okay? Because if you think that this comes from a, a, a diagnostic sample of a tumor from a patient, you can, you can appreciate that you don't have an enormous amount of tissue to deal with. This is not, uh, you know, uh, if you have like animal animals uh, studies where you want one tumor, but you have five mice with the same tumor, then you can have more. But sometimes the tumors, the tumors that you get from the clinic for this sort of work is surplus tumor that it's not a lot. So uh, depending on what we have, we try to do triplicates on each condition. Uh, but we also... Uh, have a lot of controls and sometimes we try to put controls not not you know we don't try to use serial slices let's say slice one two three for controls and then slice five four five six for experimental we might mix them up in order to kind of like try and be more fair uh, within the the range of the thickness of the tumor that we are slicing because we might, we might, we might, you know, th there is heterogeneity within the tumor. So we kind of like try to minimize that. Got it. Got it. And I think we have one more question, which is, um, are you normalizing your LDH um, um, ELISA, uh, ELISA data according to slice size and variability? Sorry, can you repeat again? Um, are you normalizing your LDH ELISA study? Um, ELISA data according to slice mm -hmm. size and variability? Uh, well, we did some of that to determine what would be the, the basal LDH ELISA for uh, tumor, tumor slices that are cut at 500 micrometers. So now, so we're normalizing based on that, based on this basal thing. Got it. Um, well, Sorry, thank you so I much. Need, I think we got need, everybody's questions. Can I can I just uh, yes 
Yes, so Ricardo uh, actually wants to rephrase his question. Do you infiltrate the tissue with agarose? Um, Ricardo, I can, I will email you as well, but uh, and depending on the tissue, if your tissue is porous uh, or very soft, you can try to, um, uh, to infiltrate it with some agarose, cool it down, and then embed it within the syringe of the compressed dome. But it is, if it's very, very firm, you don't need to. If it's very fibrotic, you don't need to, okay? Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Estero. Um, uh, you're welcome. I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, speaking to you about it. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, having a discussion uh, with all of you. And thank you for the questions, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and end this. And um, everyone have a wonderful week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.